I think the other idea is also interesting because we say that if the product, if it contains a chiral carbon, what is interesting is even if it has a chiral carbon, it will be optically inactive. So maybe if I come back to step three and I look at the product here. So if I consider this carbon, hopefully we can see that it is bonded to four different groups. It is bonded to an OH group, a nitrile, R prime, and R group. So it is bonded to four different groups. This carbon is chiral. Chiral, usually we will think that, oh, if it is a chiral carbon, then it should be optically active and it is able to rotate plain polarized light. But there's one scenario where even if I have a chiral carbon, it is optically inactive. That is when I have a racemic mixture. So this is interesting and we do want to take note of that. So I think what is in the notes here, the bond is drawn as a normal bond. So maybe we can do a slight modification. R prime, you draw it towards you. Solid triangle to represent the bond that is pointing towards you. R, you uh, draw a total triangle to represent the bond that is pointing away from you. So basically, the reason why I end up with a racemic mixture is because of the shape with respect to your carbonyl carbon. Carbonyl carbon is trigonal planar, so it is flat. The way we draw this, we draw it lying down, but basically this is flat. If it is flat, means that both sides are equally exposed. On top and at the bottom are equally exposed because it is planar. So therefore, the nitrile can attack from the top 50% of the time. It can attack from the bottom 50% of the time. So the idea is that it is planar, both sides equally exposed. So it can be attacked by the nucleophile from both sides to equal extent. I'll end up with a racemic mixture. If you follow the orientation of the groups and you draw the bonds and the groups shouldn't be that much of a problem for us to draw this guy. Nitrile, if it comes in from the top, path A eh, from the top 50% of the time, then the nitrile will be on top. Oxygen, which will be converted to my OH group, it is on the paper, keep it on the paper. R prime, towards you, keep it towards you. R away from you, keep it away from you. So you form 50% of this guy on top. Then if the nitrile attacks path B from the bottom 50% of the time, I'll end up with this guy at the bottom. Nitrile at the bottom, correct? Pointing down. Then OH group on the paper, R prime towards you, R away from you. So you draw the orientation of the groups exactly the same as that as the reactant, we will be able to figure out the product. You notice these two guys are mirror images of each other and equimolar mixture, 50%, 50%. So this means that they will be able to cancel out each other's optical activity. This is optically inactive. We call this a racemic mixture, optically inactive. Now, if you find this idea familiar, that means you say that, hey, this thing, it looks like I've seen somewhere before, something being planar can be attacked from both sides to equal extent and therefore I'll end up with a racemic mixture. When have we learned this previously is we actually talked about this same idea in SN1 mechanism. SN1 mechanism is involving nucleophilic substitution of halogen alkane. SN1 mechanism is a two-step reaction. Step number one, I'm forming my carbo cation. So maybe let us just do a very brief recap involving this. I have some space here. Maybe let me try to draw out SN1 mechanism here. All right. So involving SN1 mechanism, maybe the example that we have is this, huh? your carbon bromine bond. I have an ethyl group here. Then I have a methyl group towards you, CH3 towards you, hydrogen away from you. So SN1 mechanism is a two-step reaction. The carbon is a partial plus, bromine is a partial minus. First step, draw arrow, point from carbon bromine bond to bromine. Correct? Right? So this will be my slow step, and I will form a carbo cation. Carbo cation will be an ethyl group on top, methyl group towards you. That means I follow the orientation of the reactant, and hydrogen is pointing away from you. I have a C plus, and I have a Br minus. So this will be the first step form a carbocation. We don't need to draw the second step. We just need to appreciate that the shape with respect to this guy, same thing, trigonal planar, your carbocation is flat. Both sides are equally exposed. So it can be attacked in the second step. Huh? It can be attacked by the nucleophile, which is my OH- minus from the left-hand side 50% of the time. It can also be attacked by the nucleophile from the right-hand side also 50% of the time. So the discussion involving SN1 mechanism, we say that because it is planar, both sides equally exposed, I'll form a racemic mixture, optically inactive, if it goes by SN1 mechanism. 
And this is an important consideration because if I compare SN1 versus SN2 mechanism, SN1 mechanism, the product, if I have a chiral carbon, it will be rhythmic and optically inactive. SN2 mechanism, I'll get a pure sample. And therefore, the product, if I have a chiral carbon, you'll be optically active. So uh, an important difference between SN1 and SN2 is the optical activity of the product if it contains a chiral carbon. So by right, if we have done nucleophilic substitution mechanism, we should find this familiar. So this is where it is important. Huh? We notice that this idea involving I have a mechanism and then the product turns out to be a rhythmic mixture, if it only applies to one instance out of so many mechanisms that we have done, then maybe really this thing is, is very special, only unique to this particular mechanism, then actually it's not so important eh, because it's like so special. It is like a special case. But if I have two different mechanisms involving two different functional groups, involving SN1 mechanism for halogenal alkene, involving nucleophilic addition reaction for my carbonyl compound, two different mechanisms involving two different functional groups, if the property of the product happens to be the same, then we realize that, oh, this is not unique to a functional group. I can apply this to a second functional group, which will also mean that it will apply to a third functional group if the criteria is the same, correct? If the conditions are the same, then I will be able to apply this to a new scenario. So this is what we want to keep in mind. Huh? If it applies to only one guy, then it's a special case. If it happens again, apply to another guy, oh, then there must be something that binds them together fundamentally. So we need to understand why these two different things but end up with the same outcome. So I need to understand so that when you're given a third scenario involving a third functional group, we will be able to apply the same idea and we can predict whether the product is rhythmic or not. So we need to be able to do that. Uh, hopefully we understand or we can appreciate that. The reason why both SN1 mechanism and nucleophilic addition mechanism will give me a product which is rhythmic. If I have a chiral carbon, uh, the product is rhythmic is because the reactive carbon is planar. So SN1 mechanism, your carbocation is planar, trigonal planar. Carbonyl compound itself, the carbon is already planar. So it's a very simple idea. It's because my reactive carbon is planar. So therefore, a same story, both sides are equally exposed. It can be attacked from both sides to an equal extent. I will end up with a rhythmic mixture. So do take note of that. This means that if you're given another functional group, or if you're given a mechanism in detail, and you notice during the mechanism, we have a planar carbon, which is a reactive species. And when it takes part in reaction, and if the product happens to have a chiral carbon, most likely the product will be rhythmic because of the same idea, planar, both sides equally exposed, attacked by the reactive species from both sides to equal extent, I'll end up with a rhythmic mixture. So do take note of that. And we want to be able to apply again, uh, we want to be able to apply this to new scenarios based on what we have talked about. So in general, if the question tells you that I have something which is optically inactive, there are two possible scenarios. The first one is hardly interesting. No chiral carbon, obvious, right? No chiral carbon, then this guy will be optically inactive. So not particularly interesting. The one which is interesting is I can have a chiral carbon, but because I'm forming a rhythmic mixture, equimolar mixture of both optical isomers, they'll cancel out each other's optical activity, and so therefore, the outcome will be optically inactive, especially if they consider the mechanism or if they draw the mechanism. Then we have to be conscious involving this. We have to be a bit mindful. And explicitly in syllabus, we have learned two mechanisms that has this outcome, SN1 mechanism involving halogenal alkene, nucleophilic addition mechanism involving carbonyl compound. Again, it doesn't just apply to these two guys. We should be able to apply this to other scenarios as long as it involves planar carbon.